so welcome everyone to the participation in Parasport webinar. Um, my name is Julia Haynes. I'm currently a student research assistant working at CanTrials, and I have been in this role for the past three years. Um, I have a hemiplegia, so you can see one way I adapt to playing sledge hockey is wearing a splint that goes from my shoulder all the way down to my thumb and taping my affected hand into the stick. So in a lot of the sports that I've had to do, I've had to get a bit creative um, with what I, uh, with how I can participate in the sport. I am lucky enough and fortunate enough to have had the opportunity to compete at the Canada Summer Games this past summer, uh, a few weeks ago, where I won two gold medals for shot put and discus. Uh, over the years, I've dabbled in a lot of para sports. Um, some of the highlights include sledge hockey, winter basketball, and field. I'm super passionate about getting other people involved in um, para sports because of the rich benefits uh, sports has brought me personally. And uh, my name is Christina Sweat. I'm currently in an occupational therapy program here in Ontario. Uh, I've coached and played wheelchair basketball at a recreational level, provincial level, and at the national level as well, um, both coaching and playing. And I also did some administration work uh, with the National Sport Organization um, for a few years as well. Um, back in the day, shortly after my undergrad, I uh, started a sledge hockey club in Nova Scotia. I've worked at uh, Easter Seals camp for a number of summers. Um, so I've done a lot of dabbling, as, uh, as Julia put it, uh, in a variety of sports and, envir in a, and in a variety of environments. Uh, lately, though, I've been, I've kind of turned my attention to um, ensuring that girls and women have positive first experiences in wheelchair sport, as well as uh, ongoing positive experiences. So wheelchair basketball is an example of a very co-ed sport. Um, it's a really great part of our, part of our sport, but uh, I was seeing that um, Sometimes it was more difficult to be the only girl in a club, and I mean, I experienced that myself. I saw it from, from some of the girls that I knew were playing, and so um, I, with the help of, uh, of a mentor of mine, uh, we created the Girls Enabled and Ready to Play uh, program, so Gear to Play, uh, and basically it's a really fun-based um, kind of clinic workshop sort of um, sessional uh, basketball program. Uh, it's every six to eight weeks or so, and basically just focuses on having a very social experience, building life skills, uh, self-esteem, confidence, all those kinds of things. We're not so focused on, you know, the scoring baskets and uh, going fast and that kind of thing. We do a lot of skills, but um, those are really the conduit to um, building that social uh, social experience. Uh, so that's kind of where my focus has, uh, has shifted and um, where I met Julia as well, so. You yeah. Go ahead and take it away, Julia. Yeah, so today we are going to talk about uh, Canada's physical activity guidelines, um, what is actually considered sport, the benefits of sport participation, specific, more specifically for people with disabilities, and what sports a child can play, um, like what options are available to them. We'll also discuss some of the resources available to help get your child involved. So in Canada, uh, the physical activity guidelines for children are 60 minutes of moderate to physical, vigorous physical activity daily, and this applies both to children with and without disabilities. So in this webinar, we're going to talk a lot about para sports and sport involvement, but that doesn't mean it's the only way for a child to achieve these 60 minutes. So there's many other options, physical education, community fitness classes, independent activities like walking, reviewing, weightlifting, yoga, many, many others. Um, but these, and these activities can teach important skills of adaptation, self-awareness. Um, they might even be easier after participating in some kind of sport or with a role model. Uh, but that's not to say that full, participa full participation can't be uh, accomplished without participating in sport. Uh, but we're going to focus on, on sport uh, today uh, for the most part. So what is sport? Um, sport is defined as an activity involving physical exertion and skill in which an individual or team competes against another or other entertainment. I'd like to note a few things here. This definition makes no mention of how the sport is played or by whom. So there's no reference to physical ability in this definition. Um, and another important note to make is that physical therapy is not quite considered a sport and it's not a replacement for it. They complement each other. Um, and both help improve fitness, but there's some unique benefits of sport participation. Um, so both are important for you. 
Some adapted or para sports are on the Paralympic program. These are also referred to as Paralympic sports. One thing to note here is that not all Paralympic, um, not all para sports are Paralympic sports, but all Paralympic sports are considered para sports, and it can be an important distinction to make. Uh, so, in terms of what are para sports, um, para sports are typically sports that have been adapted in some way using equipment uh, or other means, uh, changes to rules and that sort of thing, to accommodate a physical disability. So, an example of this would be using a wheelchair to play basketball or adding sound making devices to bases and balls for uh, something like beach baseball. Um, other para sports might be ones you've seen at the Olympics where classification is used to create a level playing field for the athletes. And so the classification of athletes is a little bit like uh, weight classes in boxing or wrestling. So they group athletes with similar abilities together so that the people you're competing against have similar abilities. Um, we'll get into a little bit more about classification, but uh, we put a few photos here of some, some sports that you might not necessarily have seen. So I, I know that wheelchair basketball, sled hockey, like, are kind of the big, uh, big two in Canada for sure. Um, but in the photos here, we've got some power chair uh, football, power chair soccer. Um, race running is the photo in the middle at the top. Uh, the uh, athletics uh, competition. Uh, at the top on the right, we've got beat baseball. Uh, below that, some wheelchair tennis and some wheelchair rugby. And the bottom in the middle is uh, sailing, which is a very accessible uh, sport option. And then uh, on the bottom left is actually a friend of mine from, uh, from Acadia, from Nova Scotia. Uh, he is a thrower, so field events, just like Julia. Um, but he's actually a really interesting example of someone who was physically active all his life, but didn't actually know that parasport was out there, that there was a competitive option for him. So he always kind of settled for being physically active. He was always one of the guys. He was the equipment manager for, for the varsity hockey team, very involved. But it wasn't until he was in his later 20s, actually, that somebody finally said, you know, there's, there's a classification for you. There's a parasport option for for you to compete in, and he was all for it. Uh, he's been to nationals a few times, he bought right in, uh, and it's been really, really beneficial to him um, in a number of different ways. So uh, our our job right now, I think, uh, in terms of what Julia and I are bringing to this, is just to try and get the word out there and um, so that nobody else has to wait until they're in their late 20s before somebody says, hey, here's a great opportunity for you, do you want to pursue it? Uh, in terms of classification, as I mentioned, uh, it's used to make competition more fair. So classifiers are kind of an auxiliary official in a lot of sports. Uh, they assess the athlete when they're entering their competitive career. Uh, often this happens both at the national level and then again at the international level. As far as beginning at the, you know, at the, at the start when someone's a child especially, the classification doesn't really matter. When I'm coaching wheelchair basketball for um, you know, the youth program that I coach in, classification isn't even something that we talk about, to be completely honest. Uh, because in basketball, uh, it doesn't really matter. I'm about building holistic uh, players. Um, some sports use a medical approach when they're doing uh, classification, so diagnosis, range of motion, manual muscle testing, those sorts of things affect the classification, so they're kind of like a bench test uh, that's often followed up with, with a more functional view. Uh, sports like basketball take a purely functional approach. So the athlete is assessed when they're participating in the activity and the classification is based on their ability to perform the skills that are relevant to that activity or that sport. So regardless of your diagnosis or your actual range of motion or muscle strength in terms of like a test, the function of what you use your body is what's assessed. Uh, so both of those uh, approaches, the medical approach and the functional approach, have a goal of creating fair competition. Um, so this is something that, that has been done at the Paralympics for ages and ages. Uh, there, it's constantly kind of being reviewed and being tweaked and, uh, and being improved, um, but those are kind of the, the two basic, uh, basic ways that classification is approached. Um, and then the way that it works is in team sports, players' classification numbers are added together. So wheelchair basketball, for example, your five players that are on the court are allowed to add up to 14 points uh, in international competition. So if the highest classification you can be is 4.5, and you have two 4.5s on the court, you've already used up nine of your 14 points. So your other three players have to add up to five. Uh, so this really uh, has a unique way of, of leveling the playing field, and is, it creates opportunities for 
players of all the different classifications, depending on who else is on the team. So it's up to the coach to decide who's going to play, uh, but the bottom line is if you want to put those two sort of higher function players, I'm using air quotes here, uh, those 4.5 players on the floor, you're going to have to have a class one, somebody with that on that lower end of um, quote unquote functional ability. So usually somebody with a spinal cord injury, for example, in basketball. Um, rugby also does this uh, in swimming. They do relays uh, and they use this, this balance rule where your four swimmers are allowed to add up to a certain number based on their classification. Uh, in other sports, uh, sledge hockey is one, sitting volleyball, there's a minimal disability criteria that you have to meet, but after that, there's not really a classification system. Sitting volleyball has a little bit, but not uh, um, not as extensive as, as basketball and rugby. Uh, wheelchair curling is another example. You meet the minimal disability criteria, and you can be on the team. Uh, and then in individual sports, uh, it's a little bit different. This is where your athletes are competing against each other according to their classification. So in individual boccia, in athletics, you know, when Julia's throwing, she's throwing against other people with similar functional ability to her. Um, in terms of uh, the inclusion of, of disability sport or para sport, a lot of clubs in and sports in Canada welcome able-bodied participation uh, or typically developing athletes to join in on the sport. So this is typically seen more in team sports, but again, wheelchair basketball uh, is a great example of everybody plays regardless of what their, their ability is off the court. So we have lots of siblings, we have parents playing, we have friends from school. Like It's, it's a really great equalizer because everybody jumps in a chair and off they go. Um, Sledge hockey is another example where some of the clubs do welcome that uh, that able-bodied uh, participation, and in some cases they they say, well, you can play if you're a sibling of somebody, but we're not just going to you know open the doors wide. It really depends on the club, um, and each club has different philosophies around this. Um, but it has uh, allowed a lot of these para sports to grow and flourish, uh, where it might have been in places where it might be very difficult to to thrive. Uh, I think. Specifically, there's a club here in Ontario where most of the athletes uh, don't have a disability, but the one the one athlete who does, that's, it, it allows him to have a team. It gives him that community, and, and if if the club said, you know, you can't have any, uh, we don't want to have any white people around, then the club would, would probably flounder. Uh, and so it's been really great um, as far as building an inclusive sport uh, as well as uh, building a community. So... We've got a, a picture here, this, this disc, this circle. Um, it's, it's called the inclusion spectrum, and it's something we wanted to share with you um, to try and open that door to sort of the way that we view inclusion and the way that we view sport. So as you can see, there's a number of different ways that you can have inclusion. So it's not a hierarchy. Um, it's, it's a bunch of different ways that inclusion can exist and still be inclusion. So at the top, you've got open uh, participation. So this will be like your Terry Fox run. Everybody participates in whatever capacity that and however that looks, right? You might wheel, you might bike, you might roll in a stroller, you might push a stroller. Uh, there's all kinds of different ways, and you do it according to you. Um, next is the modified uh, sport or modified participation. So this will be, uh, there's kind of two ways to look at it. It could be modified in terms of you've got a bunch of different size balls and everybody picks the one that's most important. I think modified equipment in that sense. Um, or it could be something like wheelchair basketball where the whole sport has been modified and everybody plays it in this new way. Um, having a pinch runner for a player who has difficulty running the bases is something that I use on a regular basis when I'm playing with my, uh, with my school in intramurals. Um, or, you know, using a tee instead of a pitched ball. There's all kinds of ways that we can modify the activity so that we're inclusive of everyone. Um, on the other side, on the left side, is a parallel activity. Uh, so this is where the classification comes into play. So a swimmer might compete with their community club, but they've got their own time standards, or um, they race against other people of similar classification when they're at higher, uh, higher levels of the sport. Um, or, I mean, you can have a sitting volleyball happening, happening at the same place in the same time as a standing volleyball tournament, and that would be a parallel uh, opportunity. Uh, in the middle is a disability sport that's pretty obvious. Uh, it's a sport that's specifically designed for a particular disability group. Um, 
generally it's only participated in by people with disabilities. So Goalball, I think, is an example of this, where at the higher levels it's exclusively for people with a visual impairment. Uh, wheelchair rugby is exclusively for people that meet the classification criteria um, for tetraplegia. Um, and so high levels like comp Paralympics, all of the Paralympic sports are considered disability sport uh, because you have to meet the disability criteria. But again, those, those can shift into that modified uh, or even parallel um, option depending on the, the classification system used and whether able-bodied or typically developing uh, athletes are, are included as well. Um, the last one at the bottom here is separate or alternative activities. So these can be used for a person to practice or refine a skill that needs to be, that they're going to need to participate in another activity. Um, or it might be something that the activity that's being participated in, um, you know, isn't really modifiable and it makes more sense for that person to practice something else. So, for example, if you're doing a long jump as part of a, a program or part of a track um, session, maybe the person uh, who uses a wheelchair is practicing throwing at the same time. Uh, so with this, it's a sport or a skill that is still relevant to them and relevant to their participation. Um, it's just not the same one that everybody is, is participating in. So this isn't necessarily the ideal. Um, usually when we think of inclusion and, you know, you say, well, this person's going to do something else, we think, well, that's not inclusion. Um, with the right intention behind it, um, it definitely still fits on that spectrum. Um, but it's, it's just a, a matter of making sure that the intention behind the alternative activity or the separate activity is with sort of the intention of bringing back into one of those other um, areas on the spectrum. So each one has its own unique benefits and drawbacks for each circumstance and person. So it's about knowing the person and knowing the situation and then making the modifications uh, or uh, changes accordingly. So now we're going to talk about some of the benefits that we can see from Parasports. So um, there's a number of physical health benefits that you can see both in parasports, adapted physical activity, and just stand-up sports and regular physical activity. Uh, we see these in improvements in overall fitness, strength, endurance, range of motion, flexibility. Um, it can help prevent or ameliorate uh, the effects of obesity, and, and um, it, it results in improved cardiovascular health and decreases the um, negative effects of immobility. So although in some circumstances the goals of physiotherapy and physical activity may overlap, it's important to note that physiotherapy is not necessarily a replacement for physical activity. Participation in sport physical activity provides the necessary motivation to achieve de um, desired physical health outcomes, including things like weight maintenance, building strength and endurance, um, and these types of things that can translate into daily life. Many athletes with disabilities, ourselves included, can attest to the physical benefits they gained from sport that improved other aspects of their lives, functioning, or benefited their rehabilitation. The effect of exercise on mental health is well documented in research and overwhelmingly positive. In addition to the direct um, effect of exercise, we feel there's a lot to be said about the chance to meet new people, um, especially peers and role models with similar experiences. In addition, the ability to develop a positive self-identity and be a part of the community go hand in hand with sport and physical activity participation. So we see mental health benefits like confidence and self-esteem increasing. Um, decreasing the symptoms of anxiety, depression, um, and dementia is all possible. And we know, especially in certain um, populations with disabilities, including people with cerebral palsy, we do see um, increased rates of mental health um, outcomes and mental illness. So this could be a potential strategy for um, helping ameliorate those. And as we said, it's a chance to form friendships, express creativity, and develop that positive self-identity, which can be really challenging, especially for teenagers. So this is, um, I'll point out, this is Christina's gear program in action. You can see all the purple shirts there and all the smiling faces. Um, it's an absolutely wonderful program, and I think you can tell by everybody's uh, bright, shining smile on their face. So the benefits of exercise on cognitive performance in school is also extremely well documented. 
For example, an Illinois school district, um, in an Illinois school district, small modifications to physical education to focus on fitness rather than sports skills resulted in improvement in academic performance. So with buy into this, um, Attitude, with buying to this attitude, the students in District 203 went from mediocre performers to some of the highest test scores in the U.S. In addition, there is enormous impact on social development. Peers can role model positive skills, and being with peers can provide learning opportunities for independence, behaviors, hygiene, leadership, and teamwork. In addition, in cases of, um, with peers with disabilities, the sharing of common experiences can help facilitate positive self-esteem and identity. So in terms of overall quality of life, um, participation in physical activity has direct connections. So we've touched on a number of these areas, but there's a few that we haven't yet talked about in depth. Um, so this uh, side of things is particularly interesting uh, to me in terms of occupational therapy, but I'm sure that uh, there's a lot of other um, reasons that it's, uh, that it's interesting. Um, there's a lot of athletes with disabilities that have told us uh, about the life skills that they've acquired through the role models and peers that they've met through sport. I know I've heard it a number of times from, uh, from my own teammates, from people I've coached. In some cases, it's uh, related to travel and adapting to a new bathroom setup or different ways of transferring. Uh, in other cases, it's learning about advocacy skills and seeing how other people direct their care or interact with their attendants. Um, and sometimes it's just general independence. It's that motivation that, oh, so-and-so does this. Maybe I should do it too, or maybe I should try to do that. Uh, those, kinds of, uh, those kinds of things can be li very life-changing. Um, you know, we've, we've had a lot of kids come in that had never been away from home, and, and through sport they, they got that confidence that, that, yeah, it would be okay. Maybe the first tournament parents come with them and stay, but the next time you hear them say, you know, I'm going with, I'm going to room with my teammate this time. It's, it's, uh, I'm ready for that, and, uh, and that's a huge, uh, huge thing. Uh, another area that we haven't touched on, uh, as I mentioned being an OT, this is super interesting uh, and very important to me, is, is mobility. So the improvement of mobility skills, whether you're walking uh, with or without assistive devices, whether you're wheeling or you're driving, it's another area that can be improved through sport and physical activity participation. So there's direct evidence um, for the relationship between mobility skills and quality of life. So the better your mobility skills, the more likely you are to access the community, especially in a place like Canada where the weather has a huge impact on how easy to get, it is to get around. So skills like traversing uneven terrain, going over curbs, up and down ramps or hills, regardless of the assistive device that you're using, if you're using one, uh, these sorts of things really impact uh, your ability and your likelihood that you're going to uh, venture outside in that poor weather or uh, whether you're going to um, have the confidence to, uh, you know, take the TTC, for example, as a Torontonian, um, up to the community center that's down the road. Those sorts of things, uh, you can see how those, those link uh, very closely and link over the lifetime as well. Um, so, in terms of sport participation and physical activity participation, um, we, here in Canada we have uh, the long-term athlete development model, uh, which was developed, uh, I think, 10 to 15 years ago now, uh, but basically sort of draws a pathway that a person um, experiences or may follow uh, as they participate in sport and physical activity. So there's a few different categories uh, or broader categories within it that we're going to touch on today. Um, these, no one of these is more or less valuable than others. So it's, it's important to note that any whichever one of these areas that a person ends up um, in in the long term is just as valuable as any other. So we're not going to talk too much about the high performance side uh, since we're focusing more on participation today, but we wanted to point out that there are high performance opportunities at the Paralympic level and some athletes with, often with more mild disabilities have successfully competed uh, in an in integrated sport uh, at more elite levels. So, I mean, there's been swimmers that have just swam against uh, collegiate opponents. There's been throwers that have thrown at OPSA, which is the high school, um, high school competition here in Toronto or Ontario. Um, so there's a lot of examples of that. There's tons of athletes that have disabilities that have participated in Major League Baseball, in the Olympics, and it's, 
it's a possibility, um, but there's also lots of opportunity on the on the para side to be very competitive as well. Um, there's different challenges and opportunities with para and para sport and integrated sport. So, for example, uh, para sport opportunities can be hard to find, or there's travel, um, but maybe they provide opportunities that to excel that uh, able-bodied sport, um, quote unquote, is uh, doesn't uh, in terms of that integrated. Um, integrated sport opportunity. Uh, but on the other hand, it's a lot easier to participate in a community sport uh, option um, than, than it might be to, to travel to, to find a, a disability club or disability sport club. Uh, so there's a lot of options uh, in terms of active for life uh, is basically what we call somebody who participates in um, physical activity over the lifespan. Uh, so there's opportunities within para sport, again within integrated sport. Like I said, I play baseball with uh, with friends. We make a few adaptations, and and away we go. Uh, as well as within a physical activity. Um, so there's tons of kids out there that aren't sporty, and we recognize that. Uh, but the benefits of physical activity still remain. So we just want to highlight that 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 physical activity piece, if sport isn't how they're going to be active, then there, there is a way and, uh, and and there's lots of opportunities for that to happen. And then the competitive for life. We see a lot of, uh, within para-sport, um, there's lots of leagues that are semi-competitive um, that uh, have great opportunities as well as within integrated sport. Um, again, with a few modifications, um, people can be very, uh, very competitive. So we thought a great way uh, to illustrate some of the sports available to different people of different ability levels would be to align the sports downward with the GMFCS. So the GMFCS is the Gross Motor Classification, uh, Functional Classification System for Cerebral Palsy. Um, and it starts at level one, where a child is able to ambulate completely independently, to a level five, which is seen on the right-hand side of your screen, uh, where a child may need more support um, in terms of wheelchair use full-time. And so below that, what we have is a variety of different para-sport options and who they're targeted to. Um, and I'm not going to say that that somebody in a um, chair and a walking who uses a walking frame wouldn't be allowed to play in seven-a-side soccer. This is more just um, who they're targeted to at the competitive or high level. Um, so people at the recreational level, most sports can be played by most children of all abilities. And so these are just some options within the um, para-sport type of things to get, to get you started. And now we're going to talk a bit about sports for harder to reach populations or harder to adapt to populations. So uh, hemiplegia is something I experience. And um, if we talk about hemiplegia more generally and just talk about um, a person who's affected by their uh, impairment asymmetrically, um, it can be very, very challenging to find para sports uniquely suited to the needs uh, of a hemi. So many people with hemiplegia can participate fairly well in integrated sports programs and can train alongside their able-bodied peers quite easily with some small adaptations. And this is um, seen quite often in things like swimming and athletics. Um, I know quite a few athletes, including Kevin Strybosch, who's in the bottom corner, bottom right corner there, who participate in fully integrated, um, fully integrated teams, and that's how they train, uh, where they compete at the higher level in the Paralympics. So it can be difficult if it's a wheelchair sport. Uh, your child is John True, then there's some can be some added learning if they don't typically use mobility aids or don't typically use a wheelchair. The good news is that um, difficulties with pushing a wheelchair or maintaining balance with the affected arm can be partially mitigated by gloves, splints, and one-arm drive systems. Um, that picture right next to Kevin going lengthways with a big arm splint is how I play hockey. So I have an arm splint, like I said, that goes from just below my shoulder all the way through down to my thumb, and my hand gets taped into the stick. And that allows me to compete against people with two unaffected arms um, fairly well, actually. So creativity, as always, as, is encouraged. And a, reaching out and finding role models within the sport is another way of um, getting involved if you're not necessarily sure how to start doing that. And I think that's a great 
point actually that I just want to highlight that Julia just said is, is finding those other people that have some experience in these in these domains is, is one of the easiest ways to uh, to find find the opportunities. Uh, I was speaking to a parent very recently who she's been looking and looking and looking for things that uh, uh, that her daughter could participate in, but without knowing where to start, it's been very difficult. And so um, we're we're working to connect her with uh, well with Julia and another uh, another um, heavy project within our uh, within our clubs to just to start talking about these things and what options are out there. So um, in terms of um, power chair users, so people with more involvement in their disability, um, sometimes it can be intimidating, uh, the physical demands and the challenges of a lot of the parasports that are out there. So it can be difficult in that case to feel confident and com comfortable in participating. But the good news is there are a number of sports and activities that allow uh, people that use power chairs to be as physically active as possible as well as competitive. So we've got a, a big list here. There's power chair sports like soccer and hockey. Um, in some cases, I know that I believe power chair hockey or electric wheelchair hockey does use a, a classification system. Um, so if an athlete needs to tape this stick to their chair, uh, then they can do that where other athletes might play, uh, like drive with one hand and use the stick with the other. So. There's definitely adaptations within every sport. Um, there's a uh, photo here, sledge hockey. Um, there's the option to have a pusher uh, if a child really wants to play sledge hockey. Um, there's the throwing events again. Bacha is another really great uh, sport that um, a lot of kids who, as you can see here, you like the, um, the athlete is rolling a ball down the ramp. So he's given direction to uh, a sport assistant of exactly where to put the ramp, what angle to put it at, um, you know, where to aim it, all that kind of thing. And so he's completely in control of the shot that he makes. Um, and as long as that athlete is the last person to touch the ball, um, that makes it a legal shot. So you can see that he's got a big uh, a stick out, out of his headband. So he's holding onto that ball until the, the ramp is perfectly positioned, and then he lets it go. Um, other Bacha athletes throw the ball, they kick the ball. Uh, whatever it takes to deliver the ball onto the playing field is, is okay. So it's a very, very modifiable sport. Um, archery is another good example of, of there's all kinds of ways that you can modify so that, you know, there's people who um, let the, the bow go with a, a chin movement or uh, see people use their toes. There's all kinds of different, uh, different ways to do it. Um, so you can see at the bottom left, I think there's an athlete who even has a... Um, their stick is attached like directly to the front of their chair. So I don't even know if they have a full stick there. They've just got kind of the T system. Um, so again, tons of different options for modification. So at this point, um, we devised a few scenarios um, that we thought might be common. They're, some of them are ones that we've heard specifically from, uh, from parents or from participants. Uh, and so we just thought we'd go through them uh, fairly quickly just to kind of like for some questions, maybe um, answer some questions if they're already out there. Uh, so the first scenario, uh, I'll go ahead and I'll read it out loud and then we'll uh, go through the answer that we had. Um, so my child walks with a mobility device, but they're independent, uh, or they walk independently. I don't want him to use a wheelchair because we work so hard to avoid it, and I don't want him to lose his progress. So what should I do in terms of sport? Uh, so there's a few options for athletes who use assistive devices to compete while using those devices or while using other equipment. As we were going through this, we found that there aren't a huge number of parasports specifically um, that are adapted to using um, something like a K-Walker. Uh, but that's not to say that some modification in a community sport would preclude using water. Um, so the first thought as far as what should I do uh, is through inclusion in a community lead. Uh, so something, whether it's baseball, whether it's indoor soccer, uh, so that the ground is nice and flat. Um, there's all kinds of, of different inclusion, inclusion opportunities within the community. Uh, as far as parasports go, uh, soccer or football um, is one definite option. Uh, there's, they're playing in the UK. They play frame football, uh, they call it, but basically all kinds of kids who use um, rear walkers, so K-walkers, uh, there's also amputee uh, soccer, where they are using crutches, uh, not prosthetics. Uh, and then there's seven-a-side soccer, which is specifically for athletes with um, 
cerebral palsy or, or similar brain injuries. Uh, so if somebody walks and runs independently and maybe just has a little bit of hemiplegic spasticity or diplegic, it's uh, it's a Paralympic sport and it's um, played just on a smaller field. Uh, there's also cycling, athletics, swimming, equestrian. There's all kinds of different options for a child in this situation. Um, but we also wanted to reinforce, because this is something we have heard, that there isn't necessarily any evidence that using a wheelchair for sport has an impact on walking ability. Um, so this kind of use it or lose it principle. Participation in sport is a couple hours a week. Um, and it's, I think, important to remove the medical or the functional connotation that we associate with wheelchairs. So as wheelchair athletes ourselves, this is a huge thing that sports wheelchairs, they're, they're a piece of equipment. They're just like snowboards, bicycles, kayaks. And they can be used by people who don't have a disability in order to level the playing field. So they're, they're very much a door opener. Um, and often, I know for me, definitely playing in a wheelchair is so freeing. It allows me completely, um, con complete control of my movement. It's way faster. Um, I'm able to excel at a pace and a rate that, that I can't do on my feet. Uh, so that experience is way more valuable than, than for me, anything that, that the connotation of, of wheelchair um, would have. Uh, so we just thought that was important to, to kind of touch on that. Um, you know, the evidence isn't there, and sometimes that experience of, of having that level playing field with your peers is, is it trumps everything about, um, you know, kind of that, that decision that, oh, we don't want to do wheelchairs. That's not, you know, uh, that's not something that is part of our goals or our plans, but um, we see it as a piece of equipment, not as a medical, uh, medical device. So the second scenario that we thought of, um, and this actually is um, something that I've heard in my speech hockey peer group. So my child really likes baseball, but the local league doesn't know how to accommodate her needs. Who can I help to to teach the coaches what they can do? So this is a really, really tricky situation. And depending on the needs of your child, the situation changes slightly. One of the biggest challenges we have found, both from talking to parents and research, is um, that's been done is the attitudes of, of those around you. One might be uh, one one idea might be to start uh, requesting an introduction between the coach and your child, so that the coach can get to know your child rather than their diagnosis. It's great if you can come with a few ideas for adaptation, such as playing a certain position, using different equipment, such as a T beyond T ball, or being supported by parent, assistant coach, or older player during play. Any of these could be easily supported in a recreation need, although we don't, um, although we, we know in reality that can be more complicated. So if you're more comfortable, you should also try and call an organization like Baseball Ontario or Baseball Canada and ask what other people have done in your situation. If there's someone in charge of inclusion practices, and if not, if there's a master coach or mentor at the community club level who would have ideas for ad adaptation. Therapists may also have some ideas for adaptations, and your child might have some great ones too. Um, there's always a way to adapt. It may just take a little um, figuring and a few questions to ask. Uh, so our next one, my child really wants to play power wheelchair hockey, but there's no club in my area. How do I start one? Uh, so this is a question I really like because it really is the history of a lot of the clubs here um, here in Ontario and across Canada. Um, I think the first step is to find another club, uh, whether it's close by or whether it's just in a similar sized town, and arrange a phone conversation. For the most part, what I found is that anybody that started a club is really eager to share their knowledge and share their information. So find out how they started. Find out if they have suggestions, things to avoid, things to make sure you do. Um, and then your next call should be to the provincial sport organization if there is one. So um, if there is one, you can find out if there's um, equipment loan programs, if there's things you should know in order to get started. Maybe they have a handbook. I know there's a couple out there about starting your own club in a particular sport. Um, so finding out that information, don't be afraid to make a phone call and just say, hey, this is what I'd like to do. 
do you have any ideas? Can you point me in the right direction? Because there's definitely lots of people out there, and sometimes it's just a matter of getting connected with the right person, and things start to flow very quickly. Uh, for a sport like power chair hockey, where equipment is pretty minimal, um, your fundraising efforts wouldn't have to be very large. So it's not like, uh, you know, if you're talking about starting a wheelchair basketball club, you're, that's a pretty big investment in terms of, of equipment. Uh, like I said, you can get some equipment loans, so don't be turned off by that. But uh, you can also get in touch with your local recreation department um, and maybe run a trial day. See how many people are interested. See how many people uh, would like to come and play uh, so that you can gauge the interest in and, uh, and decide how to move forward. Uh, you can advertise through your child's peers. Maybe they know other people or other students who use power chairs. Uh, the therapist would have some idea of, of um, other potential participants, uh, children treatment centers, uh, your local mobility equipment provider. Uh, could potentially um, at least have some flyers on hand or that sort of thing. And from there, once you've had kind of some kind of trial or some kind of um, idea of sort of what the uh, participation is going to look like, then you can start choosing how are you going to move forward. Do you want to, do you have a really great partner within the recreation department and you want to stick with them and maybe, maybe it becomes a, a town program, like a, a recreation department program. Uh, and that can be helpful because then it's kind of their responsibility, but also you still have to, you know, be, be mindful of, of participation numbers and that kind of thing. Um, maybe you're looking at a local hockey organization or a local floor hockey organization and they're bought in and they really want to have a power chair um, team in, within their leagues. There's lots of different options for, for that sort of thing. There may be other groups that are interested in partnering with you and then going through um, other uh, buildings or other sorry, community centers or private community centers, that kind of thing. Um, once you know that you've got a few people that really want to play, it makes things a lot easier. So building that group and building that community um, is super helpful. Don't try and go it alone. Um, you know, that can be really difficult, but there's definitely people out there. Um, it's just a matter of finding them. And sometimes that's the hardest part, to be completely honest. So scenario four, my child has involvement in all four limbs and wants to play soccer with his friends, but I'm not sure how to tell him he can't play soccer. He uses a power chair day to day and cannot walk independently. What do I do? So as always, never say can't. There's always a way to play. Um, where there's a will, there's a way. So I would start with seeing if a modification can be made to allow your child to participate in the game with his friends, i.e. if the grass is hard packed enough to roll on with his power chair, um, can you make a modification to the game so that every player has to touch the ball before a shot? Or adding a frame to his wheelchair like is used in power chair soccer so he can participate with his friends, potentially in an indoor arena. Power chair soccer is another phenomenal option to consider that will allow him to participate on an equal playing field with um, kids just like him. If there's no power chair soccer league in your area, you could always see if you could start one as part of the local stand-up league or see if there's an interest in starting one at your local children's treatment center. Recreational and occupational therapists should be equipped with the knowledge and skills to help you facilitate this. So there are a number of ways to get him involved. Um, it just might take some creative thinking. So we've set up a general framework for how you might get started in getting your child involved in sport. Um, attending this webinar is a great starting point. Um, and, but from there, uh, this is a, a potential, um, one potential pathway that might happen. Uh, so step one is just finding out the interest of your child. So in some cases, it might be clear. They really want to play basketball. Their friends play basketball. Their siblings play basketball. Um, and they may tell you, I want to play basketball. In other cases, you might have to work a little more with recreation therapists, occupational therapists, to help sort of discern what, what the interests of, the, of your child are. Um, and so starting that discussion over is kind of the first step. Uh, step two is conducting a web search. Um, information is very easy to come by these days, but at the same time seems to be very tough sometimes. Um, this is a tough part if you don't know what you're looking for. Uh, so if you really feel lost, then reach out. There's, uh, there's provincial sport organizations. Um, for example, Ontario Wheelchair Sports Association is very well connected. So if you call them and if you're in Ontario and you call them and say, hey, I want to participate in this sport, I don't know where to look, like nine times out of ten, they will be able to say, hey, you should call this person or let me put you in contact with 
you know, X person, um, even if you're not looking for wheelchair sport, the wheelchair, the parasport community in general is pretty small. And so just picking up the phone and, and making a few phone calls, it, it, in a lot of cases, that'll get you connected to, um, to the right people. Um, and in addition, there's databases online that you can search through. They're a little bit difficult. Some of them are better than others, but um, just huge listings of all the different clubs and all the different sports in, um, in each province uh, seems to have them. I know um, the Canadian Paralympic Committee is one example of, of uh, they've got all the Paralympic sports um, clubs that are out there uh, listed in a database. Um, it gets a little trickier at step three, finding out what's available to you in your in your area. Um, geography is a huge barrier, and in Parasport, where the population seems to be or is, I guess, a, a bit smaller uh, than than the general population, it it means that clubs and and opportunities tend to be further apart. And so, if you live between those opportunities, it can be really difficult. So, first, finding out if there's Parasport clubs near you, or deciding that you're going to pursue an inclusive option through uh, or sorry, a differently inclusive uh, option through a community organization, if that's easier. Um, again, connecting with people to find out like what your options are as far as adaptation and, and teaching the coaches or teaching the league how how this is beneficial and how they can um, how they can adapt. And then step four, adding on to that information is contacting the clubs, the recreation departments, whoever it is that you've decided to register, and then countering any barriers as, as they come up. If you run into challenges, reaching out, you know, most towns have some kind of local accessibility coordinator um, or uh, often there's special needs programs or um, adaptive programs. Like there's a lot of uh, different ways of calling it is another one of the challenges that, uh, that you may face. Um, but finding out what they call it and then giving them a call. Um, the other people are your therapists, your children's treatment centers. Um, as well as other parents and, and peer groups of your, of your child um, and just all of those different um, support options that you have, um, they can be super helpful in breaking down any barriers or any challenges that you, uh, that you face in terms of um, making that registration uh, happen. And then finally, it's enjoy the participation, enjoy the new friends, the new adventures, the new skills, everything that the sport is going to provide to you, uh, to you and your family and your child. Uh, so now we just wanted to point out, we talked a lot about the provin uh, provincial, provincial sorry, sport associations. Um, so we tried to find the list and I feel like most provinces have um, at least a resource or a person who you can call and get connected to to help you start or help you get involved in Parasport if that's what you're interested in. So I just wanted to say um, for the floor for questions, big thank you for everyone who tuned in today and everybody who will be watching online later. Uh, this is our contact information. Um, please feel free to contact us if you have any questions or would like to find out more information.